Howdy folks, and welcome to the Norfolk Tank Museum, a tiny little museum, as the name would suggest, in Norfolk, around about halfway between Dis and Norwich. And it's a museum that's found an interesting way of competing with museums like Bovington. It's not that they don't have unique vehicles here at Norfolk, they do. That, for example, is the first ever Centurion Armoured Vehicle Royal Engineers with a 163mm demolition charge launcher. But a museum on the size of Norfolk is never going to be able to compete with the sheer number of vehicles that Bovington has access to. Nevertheless, they do have a couple of other interesting machines, such as Deborah II here, which is the world's most accurate replica of a World War I Mark IV tank. But the one thing that the Norfolk Museum does that really kind of sets it apart from the crowd is the level of access that it allows you to the machines on display. You see, at Norfolk you don't just get to walk around and admire the multitude of machines and weapons. Because it's not just tanks. Wait until you see the armoury. <laughs> you don't just get to walk around and admire the machines on display. They let you get inside them as well. And they can afford to do this because they are such a small museum by comparison. A place like Bovington, if it was to offer the same kind of facilities, would have to have 500 permanent staff in order to supervise people climbing into and out of all of the various different tanks on display. And while you can't climb around all of the machines on display at Norfolk, the hatches are open on the sides of Deborah there, the World War I Mark IV replica, so you can see inside that. They're entirely happy to let you climb inside the fighting compartment of the Saladin armoured car, and they're also entirely happy to let you get inside the turret and fighting compartment of the mighty Chieftain main battle tank, which is fully bombed up and fitted out with all the radios and ammunition, everything internally that an actual operational Chieftain main battle tank would be equipped with. With the exception of the boiling vessel. <laughs> so you can't make yourself a cup of tea while you're in there, unfortunately. From inside the turret in the commander's position, you can see the breech and hydraulic systems of the 120mm smoothbore gun. Also in the turret, above the level of the turret ring, you can see the warheads there of the armor-piercing discarding sabre ammunition over by the loader's position. The only ammunition that would be stowed in the turret, for safety reasons, uh, would be the warheads because they're completely inert. Below the level of the turret ring you can see some of the wet stowages for the propellant chargers, the bag chargers. So these are the things that actually go bang, and that's why they're stowed below the level of the turret ring. You can see them there just on the other side of the breech. They keep them down there so that they gain the maximum protection afforded by the tank's hull armour. And the bag chargers are suspended inside a glycol solution so that if the worst happens and the ammunition chargers do get penetrated and set on fire, they don't instantly explode. Instead they kind of fizzle away inside those wet stowages, giving the crew time to abandon the tank and actually survive the destruction of the machine. There's actually quite a luxurious amount of space inside the Chieftain's fighting compartment. Although the museum chairman, Steve, told me a story of the mother of one of the kids who came along to take a look at the machines on display in the museum, and took advantage of the opportunity to climb inside the fighting compartment of the Chieftain. And when she climbed out again, she went up to Steve and said, that's not a real tank, is it? He said, I'm afraid it very much is, Mum. That's why it's in a museum. She says, but it can't possibly be. There's no way you could get five men inside that. <laughs> and, uh, although technically you'd only have four men inside the fighting compartment. Uh, the driver has his own compartment at the front, but still it gives you some idea of just how unprepared people are for what it's like inside a main battle tank. And yet, by relative standards, there's a lot of space inside the fighting compartment in Chieftain. I mean, I've tried to get inside a T-55, and I'm only 5 foot 11, but I couldn't sit inside the driver's position of that thing. But it's not just the tanks that they have here at Norfolk, they also have a rather well-equipped armoury, which includes a weapon that I trained on when I was young and stupid and had just joined the Navy. Oh, yeah. You use that one? Yes, yes. I did uh, drill with the SLR. Also fired it when I got to HMS Mercury. And the very first time I fired one of these things, obviously the one I had didn't have this uh, sight arrangement on it. Let me go closer. Point it. Yeah. Th this is a very specialised sight. The one I fired obviously didn't have any of this. It was just the iron sights. But the Royal Marine Sergeant, gunnery instructor, 
said to us, hold it in tight, pull it in tight into your shoulder because it will kick and uh, make sure you give the rear sight a, a lot of respect. And I didn't listen to him. And so for several years I had a scar under my eye <laughs> where the rear sight of an SLR bit me the first time I fired it. And yeah, um, lovely, lovely. It's not just the SLR, of course. The Armoury has a very impressive display of uniforms, weapons and equipment. Um, particularly given the limited amount of space that they have available, there's a couple of other weapons that I trained on there. Not the Bren, no, I'm not that old. Uh, the Sterling submachine gun and the Browning High Power pistol. The Browning High Power, of course, a 9mm pistol designed by the legendary American firearms developer John Moses Browning, although not developed in his lifetime. It was instead developed after his death from plans that he'd made while he was still alive, and adopted by just about every NATO country that wasn't the USA. Several different versions of the Sten submachine gun, MG42, Luger, Car 98K, there's another Bren, Beezer machine gun underneath that, which was the standard machine gun fitted to British tanks in World War II, another Sten with the wire stock, and a spike bayonet, even more Stens, this time a silent Sten, a bunch of Webley revolvers, a very unusual Bren there with a drum magazine. More uniforms on display. And then, arguably, well, unarguably, the most reliable weapon ever developed, the Maxim machine gun. And then, firearms history fans, starting with the Martini Henry rifle at the top through the Lee Metford rifle and then every version of the Lee Enfield, including the Mark V jungle carbine, pretty much every version of the Lee Enfield rifle ever developed with the exception of the sniper variant. And then of course, because you can never have too many Brens, more Brens. Of course the other jewel in the museum's crown is Deborah too here. It was made for a television documentary and is the most accurate reproduction of a World War I Mark IV female tank in the world, bar none. The original Deborah II was a Mark IV female of 12th Section, 12th Company D Battalion Royal Tank Regiment which was knocked out in action at the Battle of Cambrai in 1917. Not everything that they have on display in the museum is actually inside the museum. There's a whole bunch of stuff outside the museum as well, including some very unusual, almost First World War looking artillery pieces, which it turns out were anything but First World War artillery pieces. And here's the museum chairman, Steve, explaining why. Right. These are a um, pair of German SFH-18s, which are 150 centimetre howitzers that um, Germany built in the early 1930s when Hitler first came to power. They're very distinct in the fact they look very much like they were First World War, because Hitler was still trying to tell the rest of the world that he wasn't actually rearming Germany. Uh, these particular two guns have a very interesting history. We believe they were probably in the Battle of Kursk in 19. 41, 40, no, be 1943, and were captured by the Russians and then reused against the Germans for the rest of the war. Hence, they now have a splash screen fitted, which was fitted sometime at the end of late war or end of the war. Thank you, Steve. He really is a nice guy, by the way. One of the other things that the museum does, which does help to set it apart from its competition, is well, as well as allowing you to climb all over and into some of the tanks, they also do this thing that they call the tank experience. They run these experiences between May and October. They last for approximately two hours, include a short health and safety briefing, an exclusive VIP tour of the museum while it's closed to the public, and the second half of the experience is full instruction on how to drive the BV-206 all-terrain tracked vehicle and the Saladin armoured car. That's the way I like it. <laughs> Sounds rather nice. Here we go. Whee! I'm so happy for me. <laughs>
in case you're wondering, yes, this is exactly as much fun as it looks. <laughs> and, and this is what you can do in the tank experiences that the museum offers. Yeah, I think it's fairly safe to say that Rita and I both very much enjoyed our little visit to the Norfolk Tank Museum. It's a cracking little museum and they offer well, so much more personal and intimate an experience, which of course is only possible because of the small size of the museum. If they were bigger, they wouldn't be able to do it, but they're not, so they can, and that's great. They also put several events on throughout the course of the year, as well as the tank experiences that I've already mentioned. They have their own sort of mini version of the Bovington Tank Museum's Tank Fest, which they call Armour Fest, which you can catch on Saturday the 10th and Sunday the 11th of August, and as well as the Saladin tearing up the turf around the grass arena, they also have the museum's two fully operational centurions doing their thing, living history groups, airsoft display teams, and a whole bunch of other stuff besides. Full details down below in the video description, as well as the link to the museum's website, Facebook page, and Twitter. I really cannot recommend this museum enough. It's amazing what they've managed to pack into the small space available, and still managed to offer a unique experience with the hands-on access to the various different tanks that you get at this place, which a lot of other museums don't offer. So if you find yourself stuck in the southeast of England with nothing to do, and you don't mind journeying through Norfolk, which, let's face it, is pretty much just like the surface of Tatooine, except with more cabbages, you could do a lot worse than visit the Norfolk Tank Museum. I did, and I absolutely loved it. That's it for today, folks. I hope you've enjoyed this Sunday bonus video, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.